is Luke. I'm the next gen pastor here at Mercy Road. Uh, I have the unique privilege of shepherding the middle school through young adult ministries here, which means I get to have the most fun. So when you get to go to Florida with all these Mercy students and paddleboard on the ocean, you know you've got a pretty cool calling in life. So if you're looking to have more fun, join the student team and we will go paddleboarding in Florida. That is the perk of serving with student ministry. Yeah, so see you guys tonight at seven, okay? Yeah, good. Church, let's pray. Let's pray. God, thank you for a morning where we get to come together and worship you. Gracious Father, we ask that you would uh, allow your spirit to guide us this morning and instruct us in your word, that you would make clear the mysteries of your, of your scriptures and the applications of your scriptures. We are so um, honored and we are so privileged to be part of your kingdom work, Father. And I pray this morning that we would just hear from you that you'd speak to us. God, I pray that we would be able to take that, that what you've given to us in our hearts and take it out to our city and our counties and our neighbors and that we might be able to be the hands and feet of Christ this week over this weekend too, especially this weekend. So Father, we're just expecting your power from heaven to be in this space this morning and we're so in love with you and we're so grateful for your pursuit of love of us. We pray this in the authority of your name, Jesus, and the church says, amen. So Josh strategically picked this weekend for me to speak because Josh and Nick are on vacation and Pastor Earlywine was unavailable. So what's the solution? You have the youth pastor preach. So it's my privilege and hopefully you're lucky that you get to, to be here this morning. Um, I'm, just, I'm just really happy to be here. First service, God's power is just in this place this morning and all over this church. And I just... I want to ask that you would prepare your heart for what God might do in your heart this morning and just be open, open-minded and open-hearted to where he might, he might move. Uh, this is just going to be really exciting. I actually grew up with very little interest in Jesus. That is the Jesus of the Bible until I was about 17 years old. Uh, and then I went to a youth camp. There was a snowboard trip to Pennsylvania where someone presented the gospel and I responded to it for the first time ever. And I had kind of grown up doing the whole conventional church. My parents dragged me to church. I screamed the whole time, and I went, and I ate a donut, and I went home, and I didn't want to go next week, right? That was just kind of how I grew up going to church. But something about how the gospel was presented to me when I was 17 at this camp, it made sense. It made its way from my head to my heart, and I was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus was now my king. Here's the odd part, though. I felt like I was agreeing to a friendship with a guy I didn't know. That was the odd part. It's probably similar to like when you get a Facebook request from someone you don't even know. You can't even like pronounce their name. You're like, I don't know if I should accept this. Accept. <laughs> or like, oh, that's my ex-boyfriend. Accept. Right? Like we, we see all these people on Facebook. Like pick your social media addiction for a second. Like Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, whatever else I don't know that exists anymore. Like pick that, right? You accept friends on that. And sometimes they're like in Bangladesh, which is cool. Like they're across the world, but you're never going to meet them. And you certainly don't know them. Like if you were to get in a car wreck, there's probably three, maybe four people in your social media repertoire that you would call for rescue. Right? There's a big difference in knowing about someone and knowing someone. There's a big, big difference. Like, you can know about skydiving, right? You can know about it, but until you spend a fortune to put a backpack on and then get in a rickety old airplane and then jump out of that airplane screaming to death, you don't know skydiving, which I've done, and it's super fun. And I remember the, the safety briefing video, and this old man with a long beard just at the end of the video is like, we can't guarantee you'll come back alive. And I'm like... I don't want to go anymore. <laughs> of course, we, we still went, and it was super fun. It was super fun. You know, you can know, about, you can know about sex. You can know about it from sex ed in high school or, like, unfortunately, the middle school locker room or something, right? But until you exchange vows, enter into a covenant, and slip away into your honeymoon, you don't know sex. You can know about someone and not know them. And unfortunately, we've gotten to a spot as Western Christians, well, we're pretty content to know about God, but not know the heart of Christ. 
that we can know about someone, we can know about God. You can even know, you can even know like biblical doctrine. You can know biblical theology and Christian doctrine, which is still just stuff about God and miss knowing the heart of Christ. The Christian tradition has always started with this great word, this Greek word that says logos or the word, right? The word became flesh, the word personified. That's what that word logos means. The Bible leads one's life. Leads one's life as a light to a path in the middle of the night. The Bible is the voice of God pouring down from the heavens like a roaring waterfall into the hearts and souls and minds of his church. And for the most part, I'm not saying this is everybody, for the most part, typically, Western Christians are very content to know about God, but not know God. And the Bible, my task this morning is to persuade you of the Bible's centrality, how critical the word of God is in knowing Christ. Clement of Alexandria, this uh, first century thinker and Christian, wrote this to the Greeks in an exhortation. He said, let us bring down from heaven's truth with wisdom in all its splendor and the sacred choir of the prophets to the holy mount of God. We're like, whoa, that's beautiful. Like, can you imagine reciting that or saying that every morning when you got up approaching God's word? Like, we're doing good to get to Starbucks on time, right? Like, I got to get my latte. I can't be thinking about church fathers right now. Like, that's how they thought about the word of God. That's how the early Christian tradition, these men and women, worked out what it meant to know Christ. Unfortunately, the contemporary Christian culture sees this great book as more of a piece of antiquity, which it is, but more of an antique than the living, breathing Word of God. And we're content to let it sit on shelves and collect dust, and now it's even become a subject of humor. I read this in a, a magazine article the other night in Relevant Magazine. There's a new translation out for the Bible. It's called the Bible for Millennials. It uses nothing but emojis. Think about that for a second. So that's like a translator's nightmare. Like you'd open up to the Gospel of Matthew and be like, well, in verse one, there's a smiley face with a tear. We're not sure if it means that he's happy or sad. Like, that's, I mean, I'm, kid, I'm not kidding. You can actually download the Bible for millennials. And they think it's like funny, but also kind of serious at the same time using emojis. I would recommend something more robust, like an NIV or an ESV, or that's a side point. It's even become the subject of hostility. We, we've come to a spot in, in our world where people are claiming that the Bible does people harm. That it's not just... It's not just good, it's bad. It's the opposite of good. It's, it's evil. We, we have groups of people persuaded by the enemy's lies and persuasions that this causes people harm. I hope to persuade you of the opposite this morning, that instead we have the most unique piece of world history that we could have ever, ever had in God's word. The most unique piece of world history. This, this Bible, this Bible was, was written over the course of 1,600 years. I want you to think about that for a second. 1,600 years and all of the messages are pointing towards Christ in the Old Testament, preparing for Christ's arrival. And all of the New Testament is pointing back to the cross and saying, yeah, that happened. Yeah, Christ, he died, he rose, he lives. And it took 1,600 years to document that 40 different human hands penned the book of, of the likes of fishermen and shepherds and kings and tent makers, just to name a few. Just to name a few. And of course, we know that it was superintended, that is supervised and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Just as 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 report, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Church, there is no 
word in the scripture that human hands penned that God did not want in there first. Do you hear that? The historical credibility, the historicity of the Bible is so dependable. It would take more faith to believe that this was a hoax than the living, breathing word of God. This book is so unique that if, let's just say, there was a demand for every Bible in the entire world to be thrown into a pit to be burned, and then we were without Bibles, it wouldn't matter. Because every single scripture is etched onto all of the stones of the globe's Christian churches. What if all of those churches were to crumble and be burned down? It wouldn't matter. All of the scriptures of the Bible are etched into and memorized on the hearts of the globe's collective Christian community, ready to be spoken for the edification of the church and for those who are far from God to be reached. All of this scripture is important. Not just part of it, not just the Psalms, not just the Proverbs, not just Genesis, not just Revelation, but every word of God is important just as 2 Timothy 3.16 accounts for that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for instruction, for conviction, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is the word of God. It is unique. It is unlike other books. It is separate. It is different. It is the living, breathing word of God revealed from God himself to man. It's pretty amazing. Pray with me. God, we just ask that your spirit would accompany each of us as we wrestle with what it means to have the word of God. What does it mean to study the word of God, to apply the word of God? God, I pray that this word would be something unique in our lives, not just an accessory or an extra application to our lives, but instead would be the primary way that we get to know you, Christ. We are so grateful for your pursuit and love of our lives. We hope that we can respond to you in an exchange of love. We love you, dear Jesus. We pray that in the authority of your name and the church says, amen. So as it pertains to you and to me today in July 3rd, 2016, like, yeah, July 4th is tomorrow, like freedom, like 1776. And you walked in here and you're like, oh, this is going to be a great Sunday because we're going to have the American flag flying and it's just going to be awesome. Like as it pertains to this weekend, specifically today, to us, 21st century Christians, 21st century Starbucks drinking, Netflix watching, SUV driving Christians, I pose this question. How does the Bible help modern Christians to know God? I want you to think about that for a second. How does the Bible help modern Christians to know God? You can open up your Bibles to John chapter 5 or power on your device to John chapter 5. And before we really dive in to the meat of the text, I, I want to give you the context of the text. And this is just so important. You can tuck this away. The, the power of the meaning is always in the context. It's so important to understand the literary context, what is being said before the passage and what is being said after the passage to give it, you know, its, its full scope. Well, let me just start off with this. We're in John, chapters, John chapter 5, just before 5 and John chapter 4, Jesus is in Galilee. More specifically, he's in this town called Cana, right? This is where he had turned water into wine. And, and an official approaches Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, my son, he's sick. My son is like, I need you to come to Capernaum. I need you to heal him. I mean, this official had come all the way up from Capernaum. Cana and Capernaum are a good ways away. And he'd come up there across the Sea of Galilee. And he comes up from Capernaum, talks to Jesus in Cana, and says, I need you to heal my son. And Jesus responds, your son will be fine. Go back to Capernaum. Your son will be fine. And so the man, the official, kind of walks back towards Capernaum, and his servants meet him halfway on the road. She was like, hey, your son's better. <laughs> He's like, really? Like, yeah, your son's better. Like Jesus had this like amazing, I don't know, ancient Wi-Fi capability of like healing people from a distance. Like he just verbally said, your son is healed. I'm in a different town. I can't make it there right now. I'm just going to heal him like while I'm here. And he did. He did. He did that. That happened. It's amazing. And then right after that, Jesus has this feast with the Jews. And then he moves into the, town, into the city of Jerusalem. So that's the context, right? So he's, he's done some healing. He's moved into Jerusalem. And he goes up to the pool of Bethesda. 
Try and say that word, Bethesda. Sounds like a really bad, like, hipster band or something. Pull up this first picture of ancient Jerusalem here. So this is a New Testament times. That, that, that dark circle at the top right, that is the pool of Bethesda. It's near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. This next picture you'll see is kind of a modern day rendering of what it would probably have looked like in its real time. This pool, Bethesda, there on the right, you can see the North Temple wall to your left. This final slide is what the pool of Bethesda looks like today. Unfortunately, it's, it's mostly just ruins and relics of, and shadows of ancient times. Uh, what's neat is they've actually found the spring that feeds the pool of Bethesda, and every once in a while, there does, their water still springs up a little bit. So picture this pool of Bethesda, right? Jesus walks in Jerusalem. He walks up to the pool of Bethesda, and he walks up to this man, and this man is on a mat, and he's, he's a lame man. He's just laying on the mat, and Jesus walks up to this man, and he goes, do you really want to be healed? And the man looks at Jesus, and he's like, well, every time I try and get into the pool, someone else cuts in front of me, and I can't get into the pool. You see, the pool of Bethesda was associated with healing, and so the Jews would come to the pool all the time to be healed. And here's this lame man on a mat coming up with a really lame excuse of why he can't get into the pool, which is why Jesus is like, do you really want to be healed? So Jesus is kind of calling this guy on his really bad excuse. The guy's like, well, you know, people cut me and I can't get in. Wah, wah, wah. Well, you know, Jesus says, get up and walk. Get up and walk. And the man stands up and he walks. Now, that is an amazing miracle. By the power of Christ's voice, he can claim a lame man to stand up and walk. And he did. Now, this is where it gets crazy. Is that the Jews, especially those who held office in the Sanhedrin, which was Jerusalem's governing body, are watching this. They're watching Jesus heal this, this lame man on a mat and worse yet, he heals them on, a, on, on the Sabbath, which is totally against Jewish tradition and against Jewish law. Once again, giving the Jews, the Pharisees, the legalistic teachers more reason to crucify and to persecute and eventually crucify Christ because he was claiming equality with God. He was claiming equality with God, that he is God. And so he perceives, Jesus perceives in the hearts of those Jews what they're thinking what they're perceiving, and he calls them on it. So Jesus goes on this like holy tirade. and was like, first of all, your theology is really bad. And second of all, I have the authority to heal on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for man, not man for the Sabbath. So Jesus claims the lame man up from his mat. The man walks, the Jews see it, the Jews are ticked. Like, you can't do that. You can't claim equality with God. You shouldn't be doing, that's not what the scriptures say. You shouldn't be doing that. And, and Jesus is like, your, your theology stinks. And I am who I am. I have the authority to do this. Then that gets us to verse 39. The most epic response from Christ to these Jews, to the Pharisees, to the legalistic teachers, to the ones who were holding office into the Sanhedrin, who were like trying to keep everything looking good. He responds to them by saying this. This is the words of Christ. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Let me read that again. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You see, church, in this day, in this ancient day in Jerusalem, it was a big deal for the Jews, and especially the Jewish teachers, to be champions of scripture learning. They, needed, they wanted to learn the scrolls at the time of the scrolls. They wanted to learn the scriptures they wanted to learn them, and they wanted to know them. And, and so Jesus went ahead and acknowledged, yeah, you search the scriptures, but for totally the wrong reasons. You see, these Jews, it was all about notoriety. 
They wanted to be adored for their wisdom. They wanted to be acknowledged. They wanted to be famous for their knowledge. And Jesus called them on it, like straight up called them out for it. It's like, yeah, of course you're good at reading the scriptures. Of course you're good at looking through the scriptures, but you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You do it because you think that in them you can find eternal life, yet I'm standing right in front of you. Here's an interpretation we get from Christ in this passage. Church, reading the Bible doesn't save us. It reveals Jesus who does the saving. Amen? Like, reading the scriptures doesn't save. It reveals Christ who does that saving. So what were the Jews doing wrong? What were these legalistic Jews and and teachers in the same what were they? What, how were they deficient? What were they failing at? I think that uh, Robert Lewis Wilkin at the University of Virginia probably says it the best, and I quote, the first task of a serious interpreter is to give oneself to the author. Think about that for a second. The first task of a serious interpreter is to give oneself to the author. Those Jews had not given themselves up over to the author of Scripture. They were full of pride. They just wanted notoriety, fame. They wanted to be adored, and looked up to. It was pride. And Jesus was standing right in front of them. He just said, the Scriptures bear witness about me. Like, look, I'm right here. How can you not see this? Their pride blinded them. How about us? How about us? Examine maybe your heart just for a moment here. Where do you fall on that spectrum? Are are you more of the kind that was like, I'd rather, I'd prefer just to have a, a long list of knowledge about God and not know the heart of Christ? I'd rather know things about God. And there, there's nothing wrong with knowing things about God, it's just a bad replacement for knowing God. We see this across our nation in contemporary culture. We've turned the Bible into more of a political game piece that's kind of on our side to promote our maybe political agenda or our philosophical agenda or something like that. We'll use the Bible. Or maybe you're of the kind that's like, I need to defend the Bible. We've got def- we to defend this thing. And look, I, I don't see anywhere in Scripture God suggests that he ever needs a defense. Like, Ever. Like, Pastor Charles Spurgeon, the greatest pastor and preacher from the 1800s, says it this way, the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose, and the lion will defend itself. I mean, that, I mean, that is the power of God's word. The question I proposed earlier, church, was how does the Bible help modern Christians to know God I've had the great privilege of uh, almost finishing up my, my time in seminary. And in the academy, you learn uh, principles of biblical interpretation. Basically, this word, this annoying word called hermeneutics, or tools and methods to come to write Bible interpretation and application. I can sum up the entire semester in one word, context. Context. It's being a champion of context, right? The context was right in front of the Jews, and they totally missed it. They totally missed it. So how does the Bible help modern Christians to know God? When you open up God's word, and he has revealed himself in a special way in scripture, you're left with two options. If you can cognitively understand what you're reading, not so much apply it, but understand it, you'll be presented with two options, or two paths, rather. One path, you can reject God. That is an option. Path one, reject God. He presents himself as knowable, that we can enter into relationship with him by his grace through faith. And we can still have the freedom to reject him. We can reject God. Or path two, we can accept Christ as God in faith. One path leads us to continued bondage and sin and at odds with God. The second path leads us straight to the face of Christ to be reconciled to God by his grace through faith. Theologians did not spend an eternity. 
especially the patristics, this group of men and women, the first 300 years after Christ resurrected from the grave, Christians thought about this stuff. They thought about it and wrote it down and decided what it meant. This all culminated at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, where they were agreeing, like, yes, that's what that means. Yes, that's what that means. And it comes, it came to them the same way it now comes to you and me. Lagos, the word became flesh in Christ Jesus. Just as the first chapter of the Gospel of John reports. Let's move into a sequence of application here. Let's say we accept path two, accepting Christ as God in faith. How do we then get to know this Jesus of the Bible? How do we get to know him? I think the, the answer sometimes is largely more simplistic than it is complicated. Church, we maybe would do good if we just opened our eyes, literally, picked up the Bible, literally, and began reading it. You're like, well, Luke, I don't like to do that. I don't like to take showers, but I got to do that, right? Like, that's a necessary thing for my hygiene. You can ask my wife. She's like, Luke, don't forget to take a shower. I'm like, okay, I will. We must open up God's word and, and devour it because we cannot live on just bread alone, but on every word of God. And I would strongly suggest that we see in Scripture that we never approach God's word alone. And you're like, oh, Luke, I hate group Bible studies. I'll just be square with you. I kind of do too. Like when you get to a group Bible study, you're like, oh, I could have slept in. Or all you can think about is that like last donut. You're like, I just want to get that donut. I don't care. I just want the donut. Right? Like that's not what I'm referring to. I'm not talking about group Bible studies. I'm talking about when we pick up God's word, that we would invite the Holy Spirit, the advocate of God's word, to accompany us as we study it. The Holy Spirit's role, part of his role, God himself in spirit, like part of the Holy Spirit's role is to advocate and promote and clarify the word of God. The Holy Spirit will never contradict God's word. Never. He is an advocate of God's word. We know that this is the one certain place God speaks. You're like, no, God, God can speak in a lot of ways. Well, of course he can. He speaks through his spirit, through the counsel of others. Like, you bet, through dreams. Like, it all can happen. But much of that is subject to error. Like, even occults would say they hear from the Holy Spirit, and we would reject that, right? We know that, the God, that God's word is the one certain place that God speaks. So ask the Holy Spirit to accompany you and be an advocate of his word. The next suggestion I would promote is that we get to know the stories of Christ Jesus. Do you know how I know I know my wife? It's because I can tell stories about her. I can tell a lot of really fun, a lot of really funny, some maybe sad, perhaps a couple boring, but a lot of unbelievable stories about my wife. I can do the same thing about my brothers, I can do the same thing with my best friends, I can do the same thing with my parents. The reason I can tell stories about these people is because I have spent significant time with them. I've spent significant and substantial time with these people. Like, before you push back, and you can push back, that's fine. A mark of us knowing Christ is to be able to tell stories about Christ. Christ. I'm not talking about scripture memorization, even though I think that's important. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about familiarization, being able to paraphrase and then summarize the stories of Jesus. Like, oh, that reminds me of that one time that Jesus turned water into wine. Oh, that reminds me of that one time Jesus like healed this lame man on a mat, and he had like a lot of really stupid excuses of why he couldn't get in the pool to be healed. Oh, that reminds me of that time that Jesus healed the official son from a different town. Like, oh, it was amazing. That oh, reminded me, that reminded me, that reminds me. Being able to paraphrase, to summarize and regurgitate the words and stories of Christ revealed in Scripture, that is a mark of us knowing Christ. I would suggest that you walk into a 
week where you are instead not intimidated by God's word or you would throw it off as, oh, I will get to that if I have time or I can't understand that because I don't have the right training. Well, guess what? Christ used the 12 disciples, many of them which wrote scripture and none of them had training, right? You don't have to have a spectacular set of knowledge or skills to understand and rightly apply the word of God. You need humility. You need a posture of humility. So for all of you A-type personalities, all of you accountants, my mother-in-law being one accountant, all the other like CEO money type people that love lists and numbers and letters, I typically don't like to do this, but I think it is important. I want to suggest three simple approaches to God's word that will enrich, that will enrich your, your study of God's word, will enrich the application of God's word, and that will ultimately bring you closer to the face of Christ. Much of this is reviewed. Number one, we must prayerfully invite the Holy Spirit into the study of God's word. This is as simple as it sounds. We ask through prayer. How about when Jesus said, you do not have because you do not ask. Ask the Holy Spirit, God himself, to be with you in the studying of scripture to be with you, to walk with you, to reveal for you the mysteries of God's word. Number two, we must familiarize ourselves with and get to know the stories of Jesus. That, at first, that might sound like a little legalistic, like, Luke, you're telling me I've got to, like, read? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you do. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta read the stories of Christ. You gotta, you gotta read the red letters. Familiarize yourself with what he did with his time here on earth, the cross being the most critical of those stories, the pinnacle, the centerpiece of our faith. Christ crucified and resurrected. I would challenge you to familiarize yourself with a few stories of Jesus and bring them up in conversation with your family or with your friends or perhaps with somebody that you're actually trying to reach for Christ and see what God does with your ability to regurgitate and paraphrase some stories of Jesus. Oh yeah, that, that's interesting. That reminds me of the time that Jesus so, did that thing and the other thing. And Oh yeah, no, that, that, brings a, that rings a bell. That reminds me of the time that Jesus did this and Counted that. See what happens. Allow the power of God's word to infiltrate the soul of man. And finally, and this one is the most difficult one for Christians to enter into, is we must give ourselves up over to the author. This is so important for Western Christians because we are of the we the people. We are like freedom. I don't report to anybody. I'm free to choose however I want. Like my blood runs red, white, and blue, baby. Like I just don't report to anybody. So it's really hard for us to give ourselves up over to, I'm like, I don't give myself over to anybody or anything. Like I'm independent. And yeah, you bet. Like independent minded, success oriented, solo driven people. This is going to be really hard for you. It's hard for me. I understand. But if we don't, if we don't give ourselves up over to the author, we will be filled with pride. We will. We will be filled with pride. Just as the Jews were watching Jesus heal at the pool of Bethesda, they were like, hey, you can't do that. Dude, I'm God, come on. Like, I'm right here. You can't do that. The scriptures say you can't heal on the Sabbath. They were filled with pride. Man, if you got to land on your knees, you gotta, you got to bow to your knees and bruise your knees to get a posture of giving yourself up over to the author, do that. If you got to drop your face in your hands and weep to give yourself up over to the author, do that. Do whatever you need to do to present yourself in a posture of humility and vulnerability to the creator. 
Give yourself up over to the author and see how he reveals the mysteries of God's word to you. At the end of the day, this is the truth that we measure all other truths by. At the end of the day, the study of Jesus should always lead to the worship of Jesus. The worship of Jesus should always lead to mission for Jesus. That is the power of God's word. If you want to give yourself up over to the author for the first time this morning, we want to make that available. We want to give you that opportunity. Here in a moment, the band is going to come back up and they're going to lead us in a couple of songs of worship. And then we're going to take communion. And there'll be a a prayer team over here in the prayer room. If you would like to give yourself up over to the author for the first time ever. Maybe you walk in here and you're like, I, you know, I'm going to go to the church this weekend because no one else is going to be there because they're all going to be on vacation. And then you found out, it's like, oh no, like God's word, the power sliced through the heavens and touched your heart and you want to respond? I would encourage you to do that. Respond. Church, This week, let this book here guide your life. Let it reveal Christ to you in the full. Let it bring you to a posture of humility. And enjoy getting to know the heart of Christ as we give ourselves up over to the author. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we're so lucky to have your scriptures. We're so privileged to have a Bible. There are Christians in the world that would just do anything to have a Bible, and we collect them on shelves. God, would you just give us the posture of humility? Would you give us a posture of hunger to crave your word, that we'd be nourished by it? That we would see Christ in every word, in every chapter, that we would not just build our arsenal of knowledge of God or God's word, Father, but instead we would know you and your heart. And anything less is just mechanical and laborious. God, we don't want to just know you for the sake of just enjoying a relationship. We know that when we come face to face with you, Christ, you call us into a mission to partner with you to restore people back to your face, Christ. I pray that we'd have the courage to give ourselves up over to that. This week, I pray that we would familiarize ourselves with the stories of you, Jesus, so that we can bring them up in conversation. I pray that we'd pray your spirit into our space of learning, that we might be accompanied by you, Spirit, and revealed all the mysteries and applications of your scriptures. We pray this in the power and the authority in all of the heavens in your name, Jesus. Amen.